first panel of day two, we're going to talk about whether Southeast Asia's uh, tech startups can lead the world. Um, I'll do a brief introduction. Uh, beside me, Hien Go, co-founder of Open Space Ventures, and in his previous life, uh, founder of uh, Asian Food Channel, before you sold it for a lot of money. <laughs> All right. uh, beside him, uh, Kwek Siu Ray, co-founder and CEO of Carousel, uh, an online classifieds marketplace that has been compared to uh, Craigslist, uh, for those of us who are familiar with uh, uh, the American company. And beside him, Alan Hallowell, chief, Group Chief Strategy Officer at uh, C Group. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Mr. Gu K. Mok, Managing Partner at Gobi Partners, who oversees the venture capital firm's uh, Southeast Asian investments. So, um, why don't we talk about what it is to be world leading? Yen, what, is, wor much. what is world leading for you? Well, thanks very much for the invite today. And uh, this is definitely a world leading conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so much attention is now on ASEAN and Southeast Asia. And I was thinking about what it means to be a world class uh, company. And I felt that the best way of framing the conversation would be to have uh, two perspectives. One perspective is if you have a product which can defend from other global products coming in, or you can export your product to the rest of the world, then I think that is a world-class product. Uh, and the other lens would be that if you are perceived by the world as someone who has a company that innovates so quickly, uh, then that's considered a world-class company. And then the question is, you know, and it's always been an insecurity of you know, the companies in, in Southeast Asia, right? I've been a venture capitalist for four years now, and there's always been this mantra that, uh, oh, maybe the market is not big enough, or the market is not diverse enough, the talent is not here. Uh, just to give a, a perspective, uh, I did the numbers last night, and ASEAN now has a foreign, uh, has a GDP of about 2 trillion, 2.4 trillion. So roughly the size of India, and we all know the macroeconomics of that, right? But if you look at ASEAN as a trading block, foreign direct investment, ASEAN now roughly attracts the same amount of FDI as China. It's about 120, 130 billion. And China's a 12 trillion economy, we're a 2.4 trillion economy. India's at 44 billion. ASEAN's open for business. So if anyone tells me that um, there's not enough capital investment, therefore we can't build world-class leading uh, companies, I think they need to see the numbers. Right. Hold that thought. So world-class product and speed of innovation, as well as a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, those are the ingredients for uh, you know, supporting a world-class uh, uh, company. How about Siray? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think building world class companies is like what what um, you know, Jack Ma said yesterday. You have to be an, an optimist. Uh, I think that really stuck with me from yesterday. And I think optimism in the sense that like a lot of us in this room here, if we have certain passions, talents, like how can we channel that to create opportunity to solve real problems at scale? And technology is constantly evolving, iterating, improving, um, and a much more rapid clip. Um, and I think it's important for um, world-class companies to embrace that. So, so on that note, like you know, when we started Carousel six and a half years ago, uh, me and my two co-founders were just graduating from NUS, but we were very fortunate to, have us to spend a year in Silicon Valley. And that was where we realized the power of technology, the power of technology to solve meaningful problems at scale. And that's like a personal uh, purpose and mission for, uh, for me and as well as the company right now. Um, and you know, what we do really is a mobile classified app, but our mission really is to inspire every person in the world to be a seller. We are today now in seven markets, mostly focused in Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, we're in Taiwan, a little bit of presence in Australia as well, but we really think we're less than 1% done. And we think uh, there's only 2% of people in the world actually selling their own personal stuff and buying and selling peer-to-peer, -peer. and we need to dramatically change that in the next couple of years. Um, so we, we feel we have to do that with technology, we feel we have to do that with empathy, we feel we have to do that by creating many more opportunities using the product. 
Um, and I think that's what world-class companies do. And, and I think we feel very humbled and heartened. If you think first principles in solving problems, you can pioneer a space. So you know, six and a half years ago, yeah. uh, we created this app because we had all this stuff that's sitting in our room that's unused. There was no easy way to sell them. And we were using the smartphone all the time. And we decided, let's just build this app. And you know, when we searched the app store, there was nothing like this. So we built it. Um, and I think when we speak to any classifieds company out there globally, they would, um, if you ask them about their mobile app, they would have referenced Carousel at some point. And yeah, yeah. Carousel started in, in Singapore. It is from Singapore. Right. Yeah. So Singapore is a pretty uh, comfortable place. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one of the, you know, one, one might argue that if you want to solve a problem, you need a big problem. Yeah. Uh, and you, if you are able to solve that big problem, you will have a big company. Yeah. So Singapore does not have, uh, you know, a marketplace. Yeah. It, it's comfortable, like I said. So, you know, how do you, how do you um, jump over that hurdle? Yeah, so from, from day one, we're never meant to build um, just a Singapore company. From day one, it's always been about solving problems for the world. We just happened to start in Singapore, where we really had a good place to really focus on. We had a very supportive venture capital and government um, ecosystem that supported startups, and that allowed us to stay really focused. And in fact, the government also gave me a chance uh, through the program that I went to, to Silicon Valley, to actually change my mind, uh, to realize that I, um, as an individual, can also make a profound impact in the world if I embrace technology. Because technology breaks down all borders. If you think about it, right, um, today to build a global internet company, to get access to international markets, you have the Play Store and App Store, so distribution is there for you. Yeah. If you want to launch an internet service in any part of the world, there's your infrastructure. So there's Google Cloud, there's AWS, and so on and so forth, right? So you can actually launch global internet companies from anywhere in the world. If you think about talent, you need the best people in the world. Carousel has 20 nationalities at Carousel. So we have the former Amazon, Zynga, Google guys joining Carousel to join this mission. Um, and I think what's really stopping anyone from building a truly global world-class company is their minds. So I think the infrastructure, distribution, and talent is truly global now. Like, borders have been broken. Um, and it's really our minds that have to embrace a global mindset, which is why the Carousel mission is not to inspire every person in Southeast Asia to be a seller, but it's about how can we inspire every person in the world to start selling. Okay, Mok, do you agree that you can basically start a, a world-class company just from about anywhere? Yeah, so I think maybe I should start the definition. So because we invest sure. in Asia itself, so the way I look at uh, world-class companies is uh, obviously it's not just the Western definition. I think in the US, there's a lot of focus on zero to one innovation, very, uh, basically a lot of technology-driven innovation. I think in the context of Asia, besides technology, uh, to be a world-class company, you actually need to have a huge impact on, I think, the uh, emerging markets, consumers' life. So I think that's a very important piece. So by that definition, I think there are world-class companies that we can start in Asia. So if you think about the current wave of <coughs> venture capital in Southeast Asia, the driving force is really these $100 smartphones that came from China. Uh, so if you look at companies like even Gojek, uh, I met them since 2011. Uh, they were actually ahead of the curve because there was not enough uh, smartphone penetration. Only in 2014, when there's enough smartphone penetration, the market took off. So I think based on that definition, for sure, I think uh, we can actually build world-class companies. In Asia, I think focus on the emerging markets impacting the lives of consumers here. Ellen, I want to come to you. So um, is C a world-class company by your own definition, I think? We definitely hope so. <laughs> um, stringing together some of the points that uh, my co-panelists have made, I think what you need to do really, I, I mean, the, the thing that we really got uh, in founding Garena, which is the region's largest gaming platform, nearly a decade ago, and most recently, Shopee, which everyone in the audience is hopefully familiar with, is now uh, the region's largest uh, e-commerce platform by far, is seizing on the unique terrain of the markets you serve, right? So uh, we know that uh, Southeast Asia delivers roughly $2.5 trillion of GDP. That's a great start. That's the soil. Uh, when we started Shopee in the middle of 2015, we were absolutely of the singular view that we needed a mobile-first e-commerce platform. Uh, in, if you think about the top 10 e-commerce platforms in the world, none of them began as mobile. Uh, and we, to this day, derive 95% 
of our GMB from mobile. And it allows us to penetrate every single one of the 17,000 islands of Indonesia. Uh, we also discovered, which I think our friends at Carousel would heartily agree, that the Southeast Asian shopper is much more social than some of my compatriots in the U.S. Uh, the average uh, customer on Shopee spends 22 minutes per day. The average in the U.S. is a little more than 2.2 minutes per day. So these are two totally different consu consuming animals, if you will. Um, and we made a, a, a number of other very important decisions at that point. And we believe that some of the other unicorns that joined us, we were um, the very first Southeast Asian company ever to list in the United States in October of last year. That hopefully is one material step into becoming world class. We're also extremely confident that we're the first of many. And uh, I think over the next two to three years, you will see the rise, which I've been waiting for for so long as a former research analyst uh, of great Southeast Asian companies. Well, I think all the ingredients are there. Can I just say that um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of, of, of C because uh, your market cap right now is about $4 billion. Hmm. And the last time China was a $2.5 trillion economy was around 2005. Hmm. And 2005 was a very interesting year for China because Baidu went public in 2005. And Baidu went public at $4 billion. Hmm. So Baidu's now at 68. So if you believe the Goldman Sachs research analysts, because I was just there, you should be long. Uh, you should belong to your company. I appreciate the vote of confidence. <laughs> uh, and this is coming from uh, the guy who actually fashions some of the latest and greatest companies. But I think the other thing which uh, I may, should not be maybe speaking on some of your behalves, but uh, in studying this market for no less than 20 years, I think one of the most common fallacies before open space and Gobi really started becoming uh, leading lights here was the belief that you could just see to see, or, or it used to be copy to China, but copy to Southeast Asia. And I think that is one of the most common failings of that first couple of generations of entrepreneurial investment. And I think you actually do need to start at the grassroots. You do need to understand what that seller of batik shirts and suburban KL yep. needs, and you build it from there. You don't go from the top down. So, so instead of copying from China or copying from the US or wherever, uh, you know what? What are some of the what, what are some of the unique uh, things that you know uh, startups or companies in, in Southeast Asia are doing? So, so I, you know, open space ventures. Uh, prior to doing this, I did a company called Asian Food Channel. So I had the experience of rolling out a pan-regional business through many diverse countries, and I've always believed in betting on the local expertise or the local knowledge or local perspective, right? So we're proud to say that we were one of the early backers of Gojek, right? In fact, we were the first institutional investor in Gojek when, in 2014. And I, I can tell the story where we were having this motorcycle uh, business and then Nadine comes into the room and he says, Hien, I'm, I'm going to crush Food Panda. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to crush Food Panda. Food Panda's from Rocket. It's a big, world-class company with much more capital than we had. We hadn't even raised the $500 million. He said, oh, no, here, I've done it. So I said, how are you going to do that? He said, I've got about 10,000 restaurants listed. I said, wow, you've got 10,000 restaurants? I've scraped it all. I said, that's very interesting, but then how are you going to do that restaurant integration because, you know, you need that panel and then... The... He says, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. So I'll just put it up there and then we'll have a, a business that's much bigger than, and I didn't understand that, right, as a Singaporean. I was like, well, where's the tech? He goes, no, no. And then we were sitting in a restaurant. He says, watch this. He calls someone over, the server, gives him a tip and says, go get me a packet of cigarettes. The guy leaves his post, goes get a packet of cigarettes, comes back. He says, you see, in Indonesia, if you ask someone to do it with the right incentives, they'll do it. So the driver, the first version of Go uh, uh, Check Food, the driver would just go there, order the food. He'd take a, I don't know, 20-minute break, and then he'd take the food and he'd go. Of course, today, now, they've got all the integrations. But that kind of aggressive thinking, first principle thinking, understanding what the Indonesian Gojek driver was willing to do, meant that he was right. Uh, I mean, Food Panda literally evaporated from Indonesia after Gojek. And that's just one of the many different stories that I've encountered 
when you talk to people like you know Quack and if you're a fundamentalist thinker, um, we would love to invest in you. And that's I think how you build world class businesses. Yeah, I think similar to to this, right? It's all about understanding the user. Um, and like in, Alan was just mentioning about how mobile um, was actually a really big underserved segment here in this part of the world when you have an entire generation of people coming online leapfrogging the desktop internet and using mobile services yeah. when they come online the, the mobile phone trains you to take a photo you know most people when you you download a phone you do two things one you take a photo most likely a selfie and the second thing you do is you send a text message right you know on whatsapp or something and essentially that trains you to buy and sell online and you know that was the behavior that that what that that really sh shaped the first version of Carousel. It was all about snap this sell in 30 seconds. That was like a 10x innovation to peer-to-peer -peer buying and selling. It was about integrating chat instead of using email, taking it offline. We built in a messaging platform into a classified platform. So that was um, again something we pioneered. Day one. And day one. Day yeah. one. And and then we also built in social features like buying and selling always was a very transactional thing. But then we created this experience where you enter the app, it was kind of like Instagram. It was photo-centric, you could like, you could follow people, it was semi-anonymous username. So it's a very familiar experience to what was training an entirely mobile first generation. So I think that familiarity and solving that need um, helped us create something very compelling, very sticky, and really pioneered this mobile first classifieds. Um, approach to buying and selling. Do you find that it actually translates well across markets in Southeast Asia? Are we talking about a, kind of like a horizontal segments here of tribes that don't really respect national geographies, or are you know, or, or do boundaries actually uh, matter? So, so the carousel experience, what we built is really peer to peer. We connect buyers and sellers. We built a hammer for buyers and sellers to use the platform in however they want. I think that's the really unique thing about Carousel, right? And this fundamental core product set that we've created um, really enables anyone across geographies to buy and sell within the communities. That said, the Carousel product is really about hyperlocal. So like buyers and sellers within Indonesia would buy from Indonesia, buyers and sellers in Hong Kong would buy and sell from each other. At some point, maybe we'll see about how we can connect those geographies. Um, but I think the one area that we still um, are very bullish about is how can we then solve for some of the friction points in buying and selling. So we launched Carol Pay in Singapore, but we really want to be launching this to all our markets because that factor of trust when you can build in an escrow, that factor of you know, tying up with a delivery partner, say like a Gojek or Grab in the market to get a one hour delivery, that's going to be, again, unique experiences for a very unique local audience and solving very unique challenges. When you're in Jakarta, like, you know, to get from one side of the road across the other road, if you take a car, it's like 30 minutes at least, right? And to walk from one point to another, like, it's almost um, quite, it's very, very difficult, right? Like, just no proper pavements and stuff. So that whole meetup behavior that we see in Singapore and Hong Kong, like, we've got to transform that for a local market like Indonesia and Philippines. Yes. There's, there's a, it's a great point. There's a very fine balance. Uh, of both of our companies serve no less than seven different markets. So I, I believe uh, we, I, I speak for my friend here that uh, we see more to recommend similarity across those markets than difference. That said, you cannot be prescriptive. If you've uh, exploited something to great success in Indonesia, it may not work in Vietnam. Yep. Uh, payments, totally different animal. So when we think about the Shopee app, uh, we, we actually have seven discrete apps. And I would say that the DNA might be 80% common, but 20% unique. And uh, again, you, we're, these are such early days. Our markets are massive, and they're only 2% penetrated. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you need to do is make sure you plan to remain as relevant at 5% penetration, 10%, and onward. And so it is that negotiation between what, work, what works everywhere and maybe what is unique to a specific, a specific market. And what's happening now is the great multinational brands are coming in and they're saying, if you can give me a seven market solution, yeah. you have my business. Um, and, and Unilever, Procter & Gamble and others understand they have totally different distribution structures across all seven markets. 
So the complexity lies with us to make sure that the experience is uniform. But if you can crack that nut, that, that balance between uh, mass production of the, uh, of the service and, and ca uh, customization, uh, you can really open up a lot of, a, a lot of new markets. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the analogy works very well because same with when I did Asian Food Channel, you just had to customize about 25% of the fee. Mm. And the multinationals have done this. So you talk to Nestle, you know, uh, uh, they, they have regional operations, but they all have very intense local operations. They would change the formulation, uh, but they would get there. And I think this idea that people have that Southeast Asia is so complex that you can't, you know, it, it's not like China or not like India. If, if you think India is one country, you should talk to an Indian person, right? If you think it's China is one country, you should talk to Chinese people. Does, does the customization um, on the strength in localization, right? I mean, for, for the different markets in Southeast Asia, does that ironically um, kind of limit Southeast Asian companies to Southeast Asia? I mean, when you go into, for example, the US or you know, China or, or other big continental economies or markets, then, you know, I, your I advantage will yeah, be gone. I, I think for us, like, you know, we, we play where we give the first three to five million dollars and then hopefully you raise 20 million dollars and you raise 100 million dollars and you become like Alan, you know. I, I think it's always a choice as to where the time and energy you're going to have. And Southeast Asia already has so much um, ability to expand your business. You know, you have a 10-year secular growth path. Uh, why try to go to Europe? Why try to go to America? Having said that, uh, world-class companies can come in many different flavors. Our portfolio also invests in Singapore tech companies. And that company, uh, you know, the idea would be to have world-class tech because the PhDs will come to Singapore. And then we would export internationally. So I think that's also another subset of uh, technology companies that come out of Southeast Asia. But use the Southeast Asia labor force, like SaaS companies use, but then export globally. And I think that's a very different uh, also type of company that should not be ignored that's coming out of uh, ASEAN um, and have sort of Singapore as sort of the, the launch pad, the aircraft carrier, but also benefiting by having the cost structure of ASEAN very close by. Oh, sorry, maybe yeah. I should jump in and yeah. offer a different perspective because we invest across Asia. So if you look at the world economy, it's actually dominated by US and China, and they control about 50% of all the GDP. So I think moving forward, a lot of the demand side innovation with scale likely will come from US and China. I think where Southeast Asia can play actually is actually on the supply side. So, so let me give you an example. So a few years ago, you know, the Chinese uh, created this uh, durian pizza. So today the Chinese is actually in love with all these crazy rich durians, right? So they love durian mooncakes, they love durian dim sum, right? Anything with durian, <laughs> right? Bad. So, so if you think of what was the impact of that is actually in Southeast Asia itself, the prices of durian has tripled. Mm -hmm. So in Malaysia, in Thailand, the prices have tripled. If you look at Southeast Asia, we're also one of the biggest uh, kind of store of nickel ore. So nickel is actually a key ingredient for electric vehicles' batteries. So with China going all in on electric vehicles, there's going to be a rearrangement of the supply chain in the automotive industry. So if the uh, Southeast Asian government is actually very smart, that means we uh, leverage on the position of this nickel, go into battery R&D, uh, battery production, we actually can be a key supply chain to this you know, global demand chain coming from China as well as the US. So I think there's a, another different approach. It's actually rather than just focus on the demand in Southeast Asia, is how do you plug into the global uh, demand chain that will be driven by the Chinese and the Americans. Another angle of commonality is the fact that we're looking at some very promising developing markets in our backyard. And so on our gaming side, Garena, uh, we developed our first uh, self-developed game at the end of last year. And we are lucky to have seen a lot of acceptance here. All of a sudden, we started seeing uh, Brazil show up as one of our biggest markets. And then it was Argentina and Colombia and countries in North Africa. What was happening? Well, our developers were obviously have become quite expert in developing games for low-spec Android phones, right? Some of these wonderful games that everyone, all the kids talk about, they're very dynamic, high quality. They would melt a phone. I'm exaggerating it, but. So we've always had the ethic of obviously localizing games such that the average Vietnamese teenager can access it and play it effectively. Well, that is an orientation of effectively the entire developing world. So I believe that Southeast Asia will be an increasing fulcrum or source of innovation for a lot of the developing world through Central and yeah. South America, Eastern Europe, North Africa, and I don't know whether my friends from the 
venture capital world no, see that on their company's business plan. It's, it's just very simple. It's a lens, right? I tell my investors, we're not disrupting anything in Southeast Asia because there's nothing to be disrupted, right? The things are not even built, right? So, <laughs> uh, no, I had my wonderful friend uh, Ming say that, uh, and obviously I'm in, I'm in the Gojek camp, right? So he said that uh, Grab just did a partnership with uh, We Doctor. Um, you know, Gojek's been delivering medicines to f Indonesians under 40 minutes over the past two years. Mm. GoMeds have been there from day one. And that's because they realized that, uh, you know, the doctor to patient ratio in Indonesia is so low, there's nothing to be disrupted. So I always believe, you know, you, know you, can, you can do strategic partnerships, but you watch the people execute. And those are the world-class people who understand the local problems, understand that the $100 smartphone has about you know, 40 gigaflops as opposed to iPhone X, which has 600 gigaflops, right? Um, and then work to create that product. And so the lens of the experience of cracking Southeast Asia, I think is a very globally exportable uh, lens. I want to talk a little bit about uh, technology and people. I think uh, Suri talked a little bit about that. Um, as you build a company uh, going from local to regional to you know, hopefully global, uh, obviously you need a strong technology yeah. and you need good people. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have enough in Southeast Asia? And if not, where do we find them? I think this will be unanimously, no, we don't have enough. <laughs> <laughs> because and you stole all of them. Oh, no. <laughs> this guy is maybe. Like, yeah. And your portfolio companies, I'm right? Trying. So it's really difficult for us. I, I think, and I, I think I talk about this quite candidly also. I think one of our biggest growth constraints was literally tech talent. Um, and I think we'll continue to remain um, that way. And, and the thing is this, right? Like Ken was just mentioning, that's, it's such a nascent market. Things are just developing. The coolest classes six and a half years ago, seven, eight years ago when I was in school was banking finance business, right? Everyone aspires to be a consultant or investment banker. Like computer science? No, maybe not, right? Like, um, but things are changing. But things will take time to change. Uh, yeah. Now, I think computer science is probably the most popular course where, from my school, National University of Singapore. But for that crop of developers who know how to build internet services at scale, yeah. it will take time. Yeah. So what we've had to do is now, you know, we had a very strong core base of developers who know how to hack stuff, build stuff quickly. Like my co-founder and I, and um, we really built the first version. We got a few other friends to help build the version. But then we almost ran into an existential problem. Well, it's like our servers are melting. Like how do we cope with this skill? Uh, so we turned to our, um, our investors at Sequoia, and they helped us bring on board really seasoned um, engineers from India. So former Flipkart, Zinger, Amazon guys who know how to scale systems at scale. But they're all in Singapore. So they moved to Singapore. So we centralized our tech in Singapore. We now have a, a Taiwan and Vietnam development center, but most of it is still in Singapore. And what we've learned is we need to have you know, the passionate, hungry, talented people with huge potential because they can also learn very quickly. But you need a few bar raisers in the organization to show them like, okay, this yeah. is how you build products at scale. This is how you run a deep learning model. This is how you scale systems. So we have to have that balance of you know, contributing to the community in Singapore, developing that developer ecosystem. We need to bring on bar raisers from across the world, the best talent from anywhere in the world, attract them to Singapore. And thankfully, Singapore is a great place mm -hmm. that they want to. And this government has been really supportive in attracting this talent. And that's how we solve for it, right? Um, and I think the region now is offering such a unique opportunity to make impact at scale. You know, we've got 600 million people here. Maybe half or more than half are still not truly online yet. Still massive room for growth, for impact. You can actually solve uniquely local problems here and create true innovation, right? Because of um, the confluence of technology and problems that never really um, exist in other parts of the world. So I think it's an ex exciting place and that's how we solve for it, you know, a combination of really bar raises and supporting ecosystems. Do you, do you feel the need, uh, do you even see the need to maybe set up something in Silicon Valley uh, as you know, a lot of Chinese companies and other companies are doing uh, for the talent. 
I think we've thought about it, but I think the current solution of actually attracting some of this talent from there, and if you look at Silicon Valley, a lot of their um, companies were also powered from really great tech teams in India as well. And I think that's where we've had an advantage. You know, I think moving from um, in India to Singapore is an interesting um, challenge. Attracting people from um, Silicon Valley to Singapore is still a challenge. We're starting to see a bit more Singaporeans come back because of national service, national duty. They want to contribute to the ecosystem. Um, but you know, if you go to the Facebook office, the Google office, and the Airbnb office in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, like, wow, they, they have a good life. <laughs> so moving back here has to be a bigger purpose mission, and I think um, that trend will come, and more engineers want to solve interesting problems, but I think we have a real shot at really building um, a world-class engineering team in Singapore, attracting people from around the region. Um, and I think some of these people from the Valley will also start to realize that this is actually the fastest growing region in the world. Yeah. Very interesting problems that's come here. And I think that's what we all have to do together as internet companies in this part of the world. Show that there's really a big impact to be made. You, you, you talked about Sequoia helping you with the melting service. So it's kind of a nice segue into yeah. the role of uh, having <laughs> strong investors and how, how to pick investors uh, when you want to scale the company. I mean, the softball question? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I, I think investors in Southeast Asia uh, have a fiduciary obligation right? Fidu to do two things. These are the two complicated things in Southeast Asia. One is to scale uh, through all the different countries, right? And we've built our venture capital firm because I used to be an entrepreneur slightly different. Half of my team don't even invest. I have more business development elements in Thailand and Philippines and we will bust open a door and get our portfolio companies to see the top five families in Thailand. And that's the one key uh, fiduciary obligation of an investor if you want to see success. And the second one is that you need to make sure that they can raise the subsequent capital. It, you know, I, a lot of people have talked about this thing called the Series B gap. Uh, I, I totally disagree with that. I don't think this is. I think if you, if you say, start saying a Series B gap, I think you're making excuses. We have 13 portfolio companies, it, 11 of them. 11 of them have raised $300 million, and we put in $40 million. The 12th one is near profitability. He doesn't want to do that. The 13th one is Gojek, so we don't count that because it'll be like some silly billion-dollar number. But consistently, we've had to go and find capital, not just from Series B players like uh, KMOC now, who are starting to appear, and I think will appear in the next 12 to 24 months, but Japanese corporates, Australian uh, best, uh, interests, uh, even people like C and Gojek Ventures, Grab Ventures, even the corporates are starting to invest. So I think that's these two things that you need to focus on as a, um, as a venture capitalist in Southeast Asia because in other regions, maybe these things aren't as uh, complex or maybe have been solved already. Do, do VCs uh, that are based outside of the region, I mean, what do they bring to the table? I think, I think beyond what uh, Hien mentioned, so some of the problems that this interior and the Southeast Asian ecosystem, technical talent is actually one of them. So in our case, we invested in a mobile news app in uh, Indonesia. They actually received follow-on funding from a Chinese uh, corporation, very strong in the mobile news app area. What happened after that was effectively the AI engine that was being run out in Indonesia was actually staffed through 300 software engineers in China. So I think one, one of the problems about this technical shortage is this, right? So if you look at ta talent, it's always a numbers game, right? So in terms of population, the most talent will be in India and China, just due to sheer population size, right? The difference is the Indians, because they're English speaking, a lot of them end up in Silicon Valley. So if you go to Silicon Valley, actually you might as well go to India because the talents are actually from, a lot of them are from India, right? Uh, but the difference is actually a lot of the Chinese talent, they stay in China because of the language barrier. So a really viable model really is for Southeast Asian companies to integrate with Chinese companies, where the Chinese really provide the tanker talent. For them, in, in places like Chengdu, second tier cities, to set up a lab of 300 engineers, not a problem, right? I think that's actually one way to solve the problem. It's actually better integration between China and Southeast Asia companies to tap on the tanker talent in uh, China. There are a lot of Chinese in Silicon Valley as well. Mm, yes. <laughs> one one uh, component that we might have been somewhat innovative in, in introducing is bringing on the large families of Southeast Asia as investors. Mm. It's been absolutely critical in our rise to you know, becoming the largest e-commerce player to have those families that are involved in offline retail, uh, the big banking families and others and in ways that I think are once again unique to Southeast Asia. 
And uh, I, I believe that uh, they control so much of the existing economy, uh, we can often uh, serve to bring them into the internet or e-commerce age uh, through that connection. But you know, we, we spent some amount of our IPO roadshow educating uh, U.S. investors uh, about some of these massive uh, uh, business conglomerates, but they've been absolutely critical on a daily basis for us to uh, continue to expand. I want to leave some time for uh, questions uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, do, we, do we have any questions? We have had a very interesting panel. This gentleman over here, please. Uh, the mic is coming your way. Yeah. My name is Mahmoud Ali, um, and my question is to all the panelists. Uh, yesterday and today we have heard about how IT technology changes are going to transform the workplace landscape. Uh, perhaps it, it could happen in some, some areas uh, during the next generation, 20 odd years, uh, AI, robotics, automation, 3D manufacturing, and the stuff that you gentlemen do. Um, now, you have talked about HR difficulties of recruiting, finding, training, and employing talented uh, IT specialists. Uh, I would sort of take the problem to the other end of the telescope, if you like. Where are the consumers going to come from? The people who will use your services and pay your revenue. Uh, traditionally, kids have gone to school, acquired knowledge and skills, gotten a job, had a disposable income, used that, um, to consume. Now, if you have a totally transformed jobs landscape and you do not change the system of education, skill acquisition, who is going to consume your services? Yes. What sort of service, what sort of advice would you give society? That, permission. <laughs> <laughs> I've been telling people in this, in this conference, and what Francis said about let's invest in infrastructure. Let's invest in education. But you know what's the problem with education? It's a long time before you get the dividends. I think a durian tree takes seven years. <laughs> Palm oil, maybe eight. Education is probably 10 to 15. You know, the Chinese, like Singapore, Singaporeans used to have a great arbitrage. You know, 20 years ago, we go to China and we'd be able to speak English. The Chinese have been teaching their population to speak English for the past 20 years. Today, we hire Chinese people in our firm so that we can communicate and, and really know the, the Chinese audience. Education has to be the number one investment, but it's so challenging for the governments. Singapore is fortunate we've been able to think in a 10, 15 year perspective. China has been able to do that. And I have a lot of sympathy for, for countries in ASEAN because it is a long journey, but you have to have it or else we will not get to 6 trillion or 10 trillion. We will stay at 2.4 trillion. But that's the one critical thing, sir. One critical thing. Maybe we take uh, one more question. Yes, uh, the lady over there in the front row. OK, hi. Um, my name is Aina. I'm from FMT. Um, I'm not that well versed with all the tech terms, but I'm aware of all the issues. And there's a lot of debate in the West, in particular, about women in tech. And I was wondering how that applies in Southeast Asia, maybe in your companies. How many women engineers do you have? I think in Carousel, we're about 240 people. Um, we're overwhelmingly female in the organization. But it's like it's, uh, fashion and beauty is one of our biggest categories, right? So, um, so we, we have a lot of. Uh, women in the organization, but you're right to say that women in tech is probably very underrepresented. Um, and this is something that I think what is most heartening is starting to see grassroots communities actually trying to develop this community, right? So you see about um, Girl Boss, Girl Generation, you see heroes like Rachel oh, and Bonito. Violet from Love Bonito <laughs> starting to pave the way that, you know, this is great, like you can also be a female entrepreneur, you can be a female engineer. Um, I hear about Stripe setting up an engineering center in Singapore and actually they're sending their head of payments who is actually a, a women leader in engineering. So there's a conversation, there's a grassroots effort and I think there's going to be a time 
for this to evolve, but I feel the wave of change coming. It's, come, it's here. I mean, just to add that one yeah. point, I mean, I, we were fortunate enough to invest into Love Bonito, uh, e-commerce, female fashion. Uh, the firm loves anything that's female, female consuming on the e-commerce side. We're trying to find same investments in Philippines and stuff like that. When we invested into Love Bonito, uh, I sent them a KPI. Can you please double the number of men in your firm from three to six? <laughs> They're like 35 other women. It's, it's basically a cult of women folk who understand women and will sell clothes to women. And we ended up investing in them versus other teams, you know, senior management teams with guys and from Harvard and stuff like that because Rachel, Rachel's a killer, you know, and, and she knows the business and I don't see that uh, dynamic changing anytime soon, especially in Southeast Asia, where there's so many, uh, you know, people, uh, both men and women who want to uh, join on the revolution. And um, the board, yeah. I think we also invest in a lot of women entrepreneurs. About one quarter of the company that we invested in are founded by women. Uh, but there's a very uh, simple business logic to it because I think in this business world that's dominated by men, uh, the women entrepreneurs who are able to stand up, they're actually definitely a super woman. So that's why we invest in them. <laughs> Thank you, and that's all the time we have uh, for this panel. A uh, round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much.